Hey everybody, uh, hope everybody is doing well. Uh, I'm not going to be long, but I did definitely talk to you about this. Uh, it's important now. You know, you know how this stuff goes, right? Um, if you like what you hear, see, uh, if you are engaged, uh, if you are encouraged, inspired, informed, click the like button. Share it. Click the follow button or the subscribe button, depending on where you're watching it at. If you believe in the work that we've been doing at the Odyssey Project, Black Men Lead, Restoring Ghettos, Forgotten Daughters, all the work we do with black, black, black boys and black girls, uh, the Research Center, the Think Tank, all of that. If you believe in that work, click one of those links in the description box and donate. Uh, I can't express enough how important it is to support the things that are supporting the community and and helping the community and so forth on that note let me get into this you know how I'm always telling you guys we get left behind we get stepped on we get molly whopped because we don't know how things work well here comes one of those things right uh, and I'm going to do this, like I said, as quickly as I possibly can. So this isn't one of those in-depth, highly technical type things. This is going to be something that I'm going to break down to you. You can go research it and look it up yourself, but you need to understand this. Okay. You know how uh, Dems made this big old push and talked about how horrible the policies were with the way that uh, immigrants were being treated at uh, the border and that there needed to be new policies and a whole bunch of new things and I am the first to believe that you provide aid whenever possible this isn't about being inhumane this isn't about uh, ignoring the suffering of other people but what it is about is self-preservation and understanding that it is impossible to help others when you aren't receiving help and you're not able to help yourselves the first thing you must do before you can help anyone else is make sure you're standing on solid ground so blacks shouldn't have had a fight uh, shouldn't have had a rooster in that fight but of course we go to war for everyone else and no one ever comes to war with us well here we are chickens are coming home to roost and here's the problem uh joe biden has uh uh signed into policy you know those things those beautiful things that presidents are able to do uh into policy uh where he's legalizing 500 i think 510,000 uh i want to say venezuelan uh refugees to be moved to Chicago. Uh, New York has already been hit hard. Uh, Airbnb um, people, and I know a few people who have Airbnbs in New York, are basically being bombarded and taken over and hijacked for these new policies. They're gonna run those particular people out of business facilitating this. But here, here's, here's where it gets interesting on a grand scale and why we need to understand how things work. Okay. What you got to understand is moves are being made on a scale that will provide a boost as a whole. So when you look at an influx, influx of migrants into any one particular area, what you're going to get is uh, you're going to get an increase and a boost in GTP, which is gross domestic product. That's the total uh, monetary or market value of the products and services produced within the confines or the uh, borders of our country. It is one of the primary mechanisms used to uh, determine or interpret the health of one's economy. So the influx of migrants provides businesses and companies with access to more workers, more skills. Uh, and a lot of times at a cheaper price. So overall, it's going to be a boost to the GDP. In it. But here's the problem. When they, th at the same time, there are these things called distributional consequences. There are two primary distributional consequences that happen when this, when this happens. And we're not even talking about 500,000 hitting the city at once. This is what's being happening. They're flooding these systems. We're not even talking about that level. We're talking about 16,000, 20,000, 30,000 hitting a, a city in one big hit. It has an impact. We're talking about massive influx. Okay, here's what happens. Let's take Chicago, for instance, where, the, where this is going to happen. You already have blacks at or below the poverty line in large numbers. You have another, another, uh, another large segment of blacks in lower middle class. These are your... Uh, moderately skilled 
uh, black, low to moderately skilled, bl moderately skilled blacks. The low, low skilled blacks are going to be in income. Now, normally, what happens in the first distributional consequence is what competition for jobs. So then, what happens is you get migrant workers come in, and let's start to say back in the day that was primarily going to be what low skilled people. So people who are working at McDonald's, people who are working at the grocery store, stocking, all that stuff like that, those jobs were going to become highly competitive. And a lot of times the citizens who are actually citizens are going to be the one out because you can get the labor cheaper. There's a lot of other benefits you don't have to charge. Now, uh, that is one of the problems that you're going to face. Now, here's the problem. What we're finding out in a large number of these uh, migrants and refugees that are coming over is they are younger and they're more skilled. So now what's going to happen is instead of just the poor and impoverished areas uh, of cities being impacted and maybe uh, being in a situation where their situation is going to become dire while the country as a whole may improve, their, their situation is going to become dire. Now we're looking at lower middle class and even maybe uh, moderate middle class now being impacted because the people who are coming over here are younger and more educated. So they're more skilled. So now we're not talking about simply lab uh, laborious jobs or menial jobs. We're talking about jobs with skill sets, jobs that a lot of our kids, if you're my age, if you're younger than me, maybe you, that are out there now, there's going to be competition and there are going to be a lot of benefits given and government subsidies given to companies for hiring them while you're going to be pushed to the side now i sit up and i told us way back when this going on we got to really be careful i mean you, you got this dim play the dims are always playing these games and they got us totally totally bamboozled on what they represent i told you there is nothing but poison out there republican poison democrat poison it tastes different and it does something different to you but at the end of the day both of them kill you and nobody wants to listen and i talked about this particular guy joe biden this guy isn't shocking me with what he's doing in the disregard of the impact of the decisions he's making uh, by these executive orders that he's signing into policy uh, for the sake of this democracy, which is going to give this at, at least uh, temporarily this boost to the American economy that is so desperately needed right there. Nobody's paying attention to that. Everybody's looking at what's going on in the Ukraine, which needs to be observed because there's 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 there's, there's a big heavy um, influence by the U.S. because the U.S. has heavy implications in how that turns out. Okay, so but anyway, the first distributional consequence is competition, and now it's not just going to be on the low end. We're talking about uh, lower middle class, moderate middle class could be impacted by this in these cities and these are mostly predominantly cities that are democrats so cities with democratic mayors with, Demo with mayors who are democrats okay so then that's the first distribution so we're going to deal with that as a race predominantly because there's no race that is more uh socioeconomically anchored in poverty than blacks and that's engineered uh and it's being more and more engineered through acts like this. But let's go. Okay, that's the first distributional consequence is we're going to deal with uh, a reduction in job access and availability for those who are already here. And a lot of, and in many instances, there's going to be a preference of businesses because of the benefits of doing so lower wages low compensation packages and maybe even government subsidies and tax breaks for giving these immigrants jobs you see what's happening here this is why i consistently push we need to be owning our own we need to be creating situations like this at the very minimum we need to be in a situation to benefit as other businesses are going to benefit from this so that we can support our communities oh but there's another distributional consequence uh and that is those who do come in who may be older and uh of lower skills may require subsidies so now there's going to be a struggle and a battle for the subsidies government aid and assistance they're going to be 
those that are competing for those programs who have that have limitations now back to Joe Biden I have been sounding an alarm on this guy since man early adulthood Joe Biden isn't newly antithetical to black progress Joe Biden has been historically antithetical to black progress you got to understand that Joe Biden was one of the primary forces about behind blocking busing in the 70s for children being but black children being bused to white schools to have access to better educations his exact words was he didn't want to see that the jungle created he didn't want his children uh, having to go to school in a jungle created by this type of policy. This was Joe Biden. Joe Biden was the primary author of the crime bill that literally gutted and decimated the black community with disproportional sentences distinguishing and distinct uh, being distinct between powder cocaine and crack cocaine. Well, we know who was smoking the and, and selling the, the crack cocaine and we know who was primarily uh, sniffing and selling the powder cocaine. Now, at the end of the day, guess what co cocaine is, whether it's in its powdered form or whether it's in uh, the cooked form we know as crack cocaine. Guess what it is? It's a Schedule II drug. It's highly addictive. It has very few, if any, medicinal pur purposes. Uh, to me, actually, it should be, as far as I'm concerned, it should be um and i'm gonna tell you something and i'm gonna tell you why i think it isn't it should be a schedule one drug i don't see any actual medicinal use for it but problem is it's only one molecule off from the pr predominant stimulant medications given to our children for oppositional defiant disorder and for adhd so you're talking about ritalin vivance concerta adderall and a few others uh all of them are literally one molecule away from cocaine these are the stimulants that we're pumping into our children and for that very reason i think that there's been a uh collective decision not to classify cocaine as a schedule one okay so the, and, and if you don't understand the higher up on the schedule the more addictive the more dangerous the less medicinal use the drug has so opioids and cocaine and a couple other are schedule two drugs opioids obviously are used in pain medications so you can sort of see why that may be a schedule two drug Ritalin, the only use i mean cocaine the only use is one molecule over you take it out and you've got that so basically we're pumping our kids full of cocaine but anyway that's that, that's for another day and I've written about it in academic or part time. I've written about it in the miseducation of black youth in America. But we we're busy doing other stuff, so we're not paying attention. Anyway, check this out. This guy wrote the crime bill. He came along, and then this same guy told you if you didn't vote for him, you weren't black. This is the same guy that wouldn't sit down with Ice Cube with the contract with Black America. This is the same person that sits up and consistently tells you there's not enough money to talk about reparations, but he's sending $35 billion at a time over to the Ukraine. He's pumping uh, billions of dollars into uh, dim cities to move migrants in to displace us. We've suffered from serial force displacement at such a levels and such a frequency and the psychological, sociological, and economical impact of that is astronomical, and nobody's measuring it, nobody's keeping up with it, probably but me. I'm sure there's some other people out there that got that somebody else has to see this. I know people know certain things, but I'm talking about are we measuring this? Because I've been talking about serial force displacement for years. And I've written about serial force displacement. That's where you are collectively together and then you are pushed out through urban renewal, redlining, benign neglect, gentrification, and moved out. Now we have a new means through which blacks are going to be displaced again. This displacement is just going to be another form of way of pushing poor black people into places where they have no place. If you don't see this, we are going to get 
totally destroyed because we are too busy buying into the idea that we've arrived while the truth of the matter is we haven't gained any ground in home ownership one of the primary elements and components of wealth building we are actually declining in wealth ownership and they are increasing the wealth gap is widening but we driving some nice whips can't afford them struggling to pay for them we're spending two billion a year, two point five billion a year on Jordans. Feet tight. Some of us even got red bottoms. But we're in last place. And the ones who are in a position to do something about it are too busy flossing what little they got. And don't understand that the only thing insulating you from them destroying you is the people that you're looking down on that look like you. The sole number of blacks as they start to dissipate in if we start to dissipate in number, there's nothing protecting us. I'll, I'll give you a prime example. Kanye West. This isn't about selling you Kanye or giving you any type of Kanye's that dude type thing. I'm not here. To, I'm sit, here to simply make a point. It's whatever you see in dude and however you see dude is that. But I'm talking about solely on this guy you look at and say, okay, this guy made it. Billionaire status. Said one thing, his money couldn't insulate him. They hit him so hard that they dropped his net worth by almost two billion. I'm talking about in less than a week. When they want you, they will comfort you. Why do you think what's the what's the other guy who paid student uh, student loan debt for the cats at Morehouse? Man, it's, God, I can't think of his name right now. But that he had to admit he couldn't do it out of his pocket. He had to set up a trust. He had to do it a whole lot of different ways so that it could be done and this trust could be paid back into. And so he set up the mechanism. He didn't set up and actually pay it because for a number of different reasons. Just look at how you are. So imagine if there's nothing to push back. And the only reason they would and the only reason they really felt comfortable with coming after Ye like that is because Ye hadn't already pissed us off. We weren't riding with him that hard. <laughs> And so he was fair game. He he had then alienated both sides. Now, what am I getting at? What I'm getting at is you've got to understand that we are all in this together. We're just in different places. And if we don't understand the intricacies of how we connect and why we're connected and the role we all play, they will consistently work to keep us separated and keep us focused on the things that are important to us while ignoring the things that are important to those who look like us that we should all be caring about. We should all be caring about what's going on with everyone else so that we can remain unified. Remember, J. Edgar Hoover's greatest fear was black unity. At a time when there was such hatred for America in the uh, Middle East, at the time that was the Cold War going on between the Soviet Union and the United States, at a time when we had just gotten past the Cuban Rus uh, I mean the Cuban Missile Crisis, where they literally have missiles in Cuba aimed at us, at the time that we've got all this going on, J. Edgar Hoover's asked the greatest threat to national security, and this man says black unity. That tells you what they fear and how hard they're working to ensure we don't connect. So anything that is producing divisiveness, you've got to understand that while it may seem like it's coming from a black person, it may be focused on a black person. I guarantee you they're instigating it from the back. They know what triggers us. They know what gets us at odds. And they constantly keep us going at each other. And it's our responsibility to understand how things work. But this, uh, So you got these two primary distributional consequences that are going to come and primarily and predominantly negatively impact blacks 
and other uh, impoverished groups, but predominantly impact, impact blacks. And for the most part, we pushed for it. Mo the vast majority of blacks went hard in the paint about what was going down on the board. Now, again, I'm not about caging people. I'm not about putting people in cages. I'm not about sitting down, separating kids from parents. I'm not for any of that stuff. But what I'm saying is my ancestors built this freaking country literally on their backs for free. It was on the backs of my ancestors that the economic advantages of the South undergirded the entire United States, which is the reason the Civil War was fought in the first place, had jack shit to do about freeing slaves. Freeing slaves just simply happened to be the catalyst behind it, but the goal was to cripple the South so that it could not succeed from the Union because it carried the predominance of what? The economic force. It was through that economic force that hyperdrove the growth of this country. No country has rose in 200 years to the level that the United States had. And that was catalyst, uh, was, was uh, pushed and facilitated through chattel slave labor. And then hyper cheap labor. And what they're doing now is they're cycling in the back around and calling it human, humane uh, services and social services. But what they're doing is they're bringing in another working class for less. And they're cycling out blacks. Pay attention to what's happening. Do your research and read. Now, what you're going to find is most people are going to tell you on a grand scale, the influx of immigrants is good for the GDP. And on a, on a basic economic scale, it is. The GDP is going to improve. It does. When more skilled workers come in, it gives more options. Businesses can grow themselves and hire more people. Uh, the GDP, the gross uh, domestic product, increases. Problem is, the people who are now there who had jobs or who had access to jobs are now competing for those same jobs with 500,000 more people just in Chicago alone. And I'm going to give you an example of how crazy that can get. In 2005, Katrina hit New Orleans. The dam broke. Flooding. People died. It was horrible. They fled New Orleans, one of the primary spots they hit. Over 107,000 people hit the city of Houston in relatively less than a week. Crime went through the roof. That's a distri distributional consequence that nobody wants to talk about, too, is these people are fleeing highly crime written places now the vast majority of them are just trying to get somewhere where they can be safe where they can work but anybody exposed to crime i've done the work on this remember i've done the research two of the primary factors of proclivity towards violence for males is being exposed to violence and being a victim of violence when you've seen more violence than the average person you are at a higher risk of committing violence so you got people who are coming here whose conscious or their norms and standards towards violence is different because they come from a place where you can get killed for the slightest provocation now that can happen in the u.s trust me in the right hood that can happen but everybody's coming from the hood so to speak, because the entire country is the hood. Everybody, often everybody, crime levels through the roof, especially Honduras. Uh, God, I, I, I looked up the three highest crime rate, and it's called the Northern Triangle. But it's Honduras, uh, I want to say Nicaragua, um, Venezuela. Uh, these, matter of fact, I, I might still have it. Then again, I might not. Nope. I do so much reading, it's crazy. Maybe I do still have it. Nope. But anyway, these the crime rates are off the chain in these countries. The ones that escaped it don't seem to be heavy, heavily impacted are Costa Rica, Belize, um, Panama. But there's still a lot of crime in Central America. A lot of this is come. This is where a lot of these people are coming from. So, uh, oh, in Haiti, uh, ever since the assassination of the president in Haiti, Haitians uh, have been fleeing here in in large numbers because um, obviously the poverty level has gone through seventy percent. 
of the people in 70 percent of the population in haiti is living at the poverty level at the poverty line okay then the violence is off the chain so there's another economy that's been destabilized that's haitian haiti has been under attack ever since they freed themselves from the french the fact that they were able to stand up and do that all against all odds has never set well with the european collective let's just put it that way and every chance they get there something going on but you ought to really look into and read into i gotta remember where i'm at look and read into and, and, and really read and research into those who were behind the assassination of the Haitian president. And I'm going to leave it at that. But here is what I'm going to stop with. It is our responsibility to protect our interests. We should by now have learned that no matter what we do, no matter who we put in office, that our best interests will not be served because our best interests do not align with the interests of those who benefit from the way that this country is ran by the wealthy elite. So anything that we do for ourselves is going to have to be done by ourselves. Uh, and the thing is, we have the means, but we must act while we have the means. We must use what we have to create our own sources to put uh, to increase our value within this structure so that we have a place it's up to us to do that they're never going to empower us inherently within their structure because their structure was built and sustained off of us not being in power it is not built for us and so then what must we do we must build our own structure within the structure that provides value and gives us uh, validity within the structure and the power we need to reside within the structure and be insulated from harm and things that assault our interests. So with that being said, um, we need to start calling things as they are. We need to start speaking our truth. And what I found out is you can get, because uh, you know I have a, a, a TikTok account where I really share positive and uplifting information, but every now and then I address a political issue and I talk about real stuff. And what I found is that they'll let my daughters dance and shake their asses in their underwear on TikTok, but don't get on there sharing facts about certain things that may upset certain people because then you get a community violation and that's pretty much around anywhere you get you get fact checked on facts you get community guideline strikes for speaking the truth But then when you don't have and have not built your own and you're operating on what they give you to operate on, you're sub subject to their rules, their policies, their regulations. And that's where we are in every aspect and in error and in element and component of the way we're living. We are simply not handling our business. On that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. I want to thank you guys for letting me take up a little bit of your time. Um, again, if you like what you are getting on this channel, click the like button. If you like anything you heard in this video, click the like button. Um, share it. Do hit the subscribe button. Do all that good stuff like that. Do that. Do that. Go ahead right now. Do that. All right. And after you do that, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look in the description box, and I want you to choose one of the ways to donate and help us do the work we're doing in the community. Uh, we have a research center with over 100 some thousand hours of research. I've personally logged 80,000 hours over the last 30 plus years uh, in, in, in researching and cataloging and writing and lecturing and teaching and creating solutions. Uh, we have programs like Black Man Lead, which is a rite of passage initiative uh, to help socialize young black males, reduce violence, increase uh, graduation rates, reduce incarceration rates. We have things for our young daughters. Uh, as well uh, to help with all things from domestic violence to childhood sexual abuse and more and we are asking for your support it's that simple so on that note I'm out of here you guys thank you for dropping in talk to you soon hello everybody it's Dr. Rick dropping here hope that everybody is doing okay uh, look I'm not gonna be long I'm here to talk to you uh, straightforward. Look, 
The easiest thing to do is to complain, to complain about what others, what others are doing to us individually and collectively, to complain about what's not right, to complain about what should be going on. Uh, that's the easy thing. The hard thing to do is to take action, to do something to change the things that we are not satisfied with. For my entire adult life, I have spent uh, energy, effort, and time and money into gaining an understanding of the things we go through, the things we face, the uh, mechanisms and machinations and, and, and all of the things that are working against us and what we can do to change that. And uh, uh, a couple of decades ago, I created the Odyssey Project as a research center, as a think tank to take what we find in our research and to use it to develop strategies and solutions. Uh, also, as a program development and implementation arm to take what we can learn and create these mechanisms and programs and initiatives to uh, deploy within the black community. We've done this for years. If you follow me, you know the work we do, we consistently do, and we'll continue to do. We need your support. It's that simple. Look in the description box. You're going to see a link to support or if you prefer to give via Cash App, which some people do. There's the organization's uh, Cash App account handle in there also. I mean, we got wraparound services that include mental health, uh, men and women, uh, special services and advocacy programs for women who have struggled with domestic violence or in, uh, in some instances, childhood sexual abuse or in uh, other instances adult rate. Uh, we have other wraparound services for men for training and job placement. We are trying to make a difference, but we do need support. This is a massive and gargantuan effort uh, that's underway. And it's so necessary. We're in last place in every statistical category from socioeconomics to politics to education to academics. Uh, we're in last place. And it's not because we are the worst. It's because we don't apply ourselves. We don't take action. It's time for us to take action. So I am challenging you to support the work we do. If you follow me, you know. So on that note, look, look in the description box and take action. On that note, I'm out of here. Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.